This is the true story of the invention of the automobile. In the semi-darkness, only the stripes of the lower pant legs and booted feet of the man, Carl Benz, are visible as he clumps determinedly and quickly on the barn's wooden floorboards. It is early on a Sunday morning on the 5th of August, 1888. As he approaches the barn's double doors, we see his shirt is not well tucked in and his suspenders are not properly placed. As he reaches the large wooden double doors, he forcefully pushes them open and steps into the early morning light. His face is full of fury. Bertha! Her name rings and echoes across the fields and meadows of the countryside. Two hours earlier, 39-year-old Berta Benz and her young teenage sons Eugen and Richard are pushing a three-wheeled gasoline-powered buggy, her husband's Model 3 motor wagon, through a break in the back fence and out across an open field. Even in her plain, dark-colored summer dress, simple jacket and hat, she is the embodiment of understated elegance. Her face is fine with a light smiling in her eyes. 15-year-old Eugen is slender with black hair. His jacket lays next to him on the seat. He wears a shirt, suspenders, and a cap, but no vest. His pants are a tad short. Similarly, Eugen's 13-year-old brother Richard is slender, brown hair, relaxed but incessantly curious, especially in all things technical. He is dressed much like Eugen. They appear to be pleasant, friendly boys. As they reach the rutted road at the far edge of the field, Bertha and Eugen climb up onto the main forward-facing seat while Richard grabs the large horizontal flywheel on the back of the wagon and gives it a spin. After three tries, the engine finally catches, pops a few times, and then begins the slow banging of its normal operating speed of about 200 revolutions per minute. Smoke billows out of the exhaust as the motor wagon vibrates. Hurry up, Berta says to Richard. We're on our way. Smiling, Richard proudly swings up onto the motor wagon and sits on the single rear-facing seat. Under the main seat is a storage space containing the spare fuel canister, another canister with water for the engine, and a bag with their food and drinking water bottles for the journey. He watches as his mother eases the lever forward and they move off. Nervously and happily, they laugh as the engine noisily bangs them down the road. Oregon says, come on, mother, let's go faster. No, no, we're going to take it slow and easy. The loud, smoky wagon rolls forward as the sky begins to lighten, heralding the approaching dawn. Bertha says, with furled brow, we have a long way to go, a very long way longer than we've ever gone before. I fear we'll need all of our wits to ensure this wagon makes it to mothers in Fortsheim. Remembering the driving adventures of the early days, just two or three years ago. Richard chuckling at Eugen, remember when we almost drove into the river? Bertha's rolling her eyes. Oh Lord, don't remind me. You boys will be the death of me. Flashing back to a grassy hill next to the Necker River. At a distance, the two boys in a banging cloud of smoke veer closer and closer to the water. Ah! All that can be seen are their terrified faces and then only their screaming mouths as they yell for their lives. That contraption is impossible to steer, Wigan yells. Suddenly, the wagon stops mere inches from the river, the wheels mired in the muddy bank. Both are shocked, but they survey the scene and realize that all is okay. They look at each other, then laugh hysterically. Back into the present, the noise, the smoke, the wagon pang, pang, panging away down the road, Bertha and Eugen in silhouette. Eugen scratches his head. 
Morgan looks at Richard with a twinkle in his eye. That was close. Bertha smiles. Your father was so upset. He was afraid you'd damage his treasure. Then she looks to the side, lost in thought. Her mind wanders to a point just two years earlier. In their living room, a dark door swings open. Bertha is watering a plant. Eight-year-old Clara and three-year-old Tilda are playing at the table. In the corner, Eugen and Richard have their heads together, whispering, no doubt plotting some new mischief. Through the frosted window, Bertha sees her husband Carl striding determinedly up the snow-covered walk to the house. A moment later, he storms into the room cheerfully. I've got it, he says, waving some papers. I have it. Bertha sets down the water and can. What? What is that? Pointing to the papers. What? What have you? Carl, grinning like a madman, grabs the startled Bertha by the shoulders and plants a firm kiss on her mouth. The boys come to their feet. The little girls look up in wonder. Then Carl holds her at arm's length and announces loudly to everyone, The patent! The patent for my motor wagon! I got the patent! Oh, man alive, Wigan says. Carl and Bertha hug each other. Tilda claps in delight. Back on the road, though they are used to it, driving on these dirt tracks is not a comfortable affair. The front wheel jumps and stumbles along on the rough strip of grass between the carriage wheel ruts, and the unmuffled single piston engine bangs and shakes the motor wagon unmercifully. Dust kicked up by the wagon finds its way into the clothes and into the hair of the three travelers. On the right side of the road lies farm fields growing high with wheat. Small trees occasionally line the road. On the left, nearby, are the train track and just beyond flows a little river. What route are we taking? Richard asks. I believe we can make do on this road, assuming it stays next to the train tracks all the way, Bertha says. That's a good plan. And then she reminds them, last Christmas we took the train to visit grandmother. So my plan is simply to follow these same tracks all the way to Fortsheim. Morgan says, well, let's hope you're right. I think it's a fine adventure, says Richard. It certainly is an adventure, Berta says, but still, I expect we'll arrive before dark. If we must, we'll stop at a hotel for the night. And then she purses her lips. You boys are a great comfort to me on this trip. The hills closer to mother's will be too much for me alone, and your strong bodies will help to push us up and over. But for now, I think the engine may be getting hot and thirsty. Let's stop and get some water. I'm thirsty too, Eugen whines. Bertha slows the wagon to a stop, and they all climb down to the ground. Eugen opens the space under the seat and drags out the food bag. He pulls a water flask out of the bag, opens the bottle, and takes a long pull. Bertha hands him the water tank wrench, so he gives the water bottle to Richard and heads toward the back of the wagon. Richard himself takes a drink, recorks the bottle, and grabs the water canister. The sound of the river, mixed with the chirping of little frogs, fills the air. Bertha stands next to Eugen as he wrenches open the large brass water tank on the top of the engine. Steam puffs out of the tank with a loud hiss as he loosens the plug. Both of them quickly step back from the hot steam. Whoa, that's hot, Eugen says. Careful now. Richard, did you get the funnel? Richard says, I don't need it, thank you. I can do this. Richard steps forward with the canister and pours water carefully into the tank. Eugen turns to Bertha. Shouldn't we also add fuel, mother? Certainly. Please get it, would you? Eugen goes and retrieves the brass fuel canister from under the seat. And Richard, please go refill that water canister in the stream. We'll need more water soon enough. Yes, mother. Richard heads off down toward the stream. Not long later, Richard is sliding the water canister under the seat. Bertha is twisted on the seat, prepared to close the storage space door. Eugen is just beginning to climb up. In the distance, two farmers and their wives are approaching along the road. 
One man is carrying a pitchfork. The other carries a knapsack over his shoulder. Eugen turns to Richard. You want to start the engine again? Oh, yes. Richard goes back and gives the flywheel a spin. The farm couples are approaching and look skeptically at this odd-looking carriage. The engine pops once and then starts banging away. The farmer with the pitchfork instantly becomes hysterical. Bertha and the boys are themselves startled by the reaction of the couples. Richard jumps up to his seat. Bertha quickly pushes the drive lever forward and they move off. The farmer with the knapsack is making tracks into the grain field, and the other three are not far behind, still yelling. As Bertha and the boys look back, they see the eyes of the four peering out of the grain. The motor wagon is now past them. The four stand up out of the field and look on in unbelief. Now, only the smoke is visible over the road as the noise slowly dies away. The wagon is running slightly uphill alongside larger trees. The three are pensive while looking back to the farmers. Then they look at each other. Oh my, did you see that? asked Richard. Oregon laughed. They ran into the field. When will this end? thinks Bertha loudly. Just two weeks ago, your father had to pay a fine for scaring people and even for spooking the horses. Eugen, remembering the incident with the horses, laughs and slaps his knee. And a dog got run over, grinning. Eugen snickers at Richard. Two geese were killed. Bertha shakes her head and tries to steer without hitting too many stones. Eugen shoots him a knowing look as Bertha averts her eyes. Yeah, and now we have guards posted in front of the factory. During their drive through the early morning, they occasionally see a farmer in the distance, shaking some tool in anger or running away in fear to hide amidst the grain. Soon the fields give way to sparse forest. After a while of quietness, Richard asks his mother, how can Papa solve this? Next month there is a wagon convention in Munich. Your father wants to exhibit his motor wagon. After a moment she continues. When we can prove with our trip today that this motor wagon works well over long distances, then your father can confidently promote his motor wagon during the convention. This will certainly help to sell it. The boys are nodding, impressed. What worries me more immediately is the trouble we may have caused by taking Carl's motor wagon. Ever since the police posted guards at our property to prevent Carl from driving in Mannheim, I've been worried no one will ever find out what an amazing invention your father has created. The police will be furious if they discover his wagon is out on the roads without any legal authority. I just hope and pray my rash act today will overcome the problems I may have brought onto our family. It's okay, Mother. I think you did the right thing. Me too, Richard agrees. In the distance, they hear church bells begin to ring. Bertha takes out a pocket watch to check the time, then says, Carl will be up soon. It's six o'clock. The sun begins to peep over the horizon. Is that one of Papa's watches? Richard asks. Yes, this is one of the five watches your father inherited from his father. Did you know he was only two when his father died? Oregon says, I didn't know that. Just as they round a curve, they clatter into a tiny village and spot a hotel up ahead with a fountain burbling in its courtyard. She stops in front of the building reaches under the seat and closes the fuel valve to shut off the motor. Eugen grabs the water canister and climbs down to fill it at the fountain. Just then, the hotel's hand-carved door slams shut. The finely dressed proprietress peeks in amazement through the curtain at the newcomers in her courtyard. She beckons urgently to her portly husband and their two teenage sons. The man gets a view of Bertha standing next to a contraption in the road. He watches as Eugen pours water into a tank on the back of the wagon. The man's eyebrows raise and his hands automatically slap to his face in shock and surprise. 
The man's sons are simply standing stunned with their mouths open. A few minutes later, Berta takes a swift look around and asks, Are we ready to go? Berta and Richard climb up onto the main seat. Eugen stands behind the wagon, gives a mighty spin to the flywheel, and immediately the engine fires up. Eugen jumps up and sits in the front rear-facing seat. A flock of birds takes wing, and the observers inside the hotel jump back from the window as the curtain falls shut. Berta pushes on the lever, and the wagon moves forward, soon leaving the few small houses behind. After a while of bumping along past the various fields, Richard asks, Was Papa good as a student in school? Oh, he was good, she grins broadly. Carl loved going to school. He told me his favorite class was physics with Professor Reitenbacher. Carl's favorite topic was learning about Mr. Watt's steam engines. Mr. James Watt was a very clever engineer and inventor. Carl told me about a time his professor made a very, very detailed drawing on the blackboard of the complete Watt steam engine. He became so involved, Carl said his eyes were glowing. Carl himself made some additional drawings. I think he already had some of his own ideas. Carl loves engines. He's always been fully fascinated with them. He said that it was Professor Reitenbacher's teaching methods which inspired his devotion by making his lessons so realistic and easy to understand. Richard asks, What did Papa do when he was our age? Indicating himself and Eugen. Well, he loved ice skating. He built his own pair of ice skates and often went skating with his friend Jury. He also loved to ride his bicycle. Your father was one of the first bicyclists in Mannheim. Really? says Richard. Eugen says, That's astonishing. Bertha is very amused. One time, when your father and I first began courting, we were to meet in a garden restaurant. I was sitting at the table near the street so I could watch for him when he arrived. Then there comes Carl on his bone shaker. She shakes her head. I had never seen one before. I don't think yet. I don't think anyone had. This was just a few years before bicycles and velocipedes were everywhere. He was very proud of the effect he created every time he rode through the city. He just loves all kinds of transportation. Eugen says, Once I tried riding that old wooden bicycle. Oh my God, is it rough. I really know why they call it the bone shaker. It's a nice sunny summer morning. Luckily, there are no rain clouds in the sky. Chapter 2 About 8 o'clock in the morning, just as mass was letting out, Bertha, Eugen, and Richard arrive into the outskirts of Heidelberg. Citizens in their Sunday best are spilling onto the street, relaxed and happy until they hear the clatter from the approaching motor wagon coming up the roaded road next to the railroad tracks. Some people stand incredulous. Others begin to edge back into the church. Only a handful are simply curious. The wagon comes closer, trailing its smoke and ungodly racket. Random dogs and cats scatter in different directions. Two berobed monks standing just inside the church door cross themselves hastily as they witness the approaching motor wagon. The stocky one whispers, It's true then, what the priest said in the last mass. The devil's coming is attended by great noise and smoke. Oh, my holy God. The younger monk proposes, Quickly, we must inform the Reverend Father. As the two burst into Father Sigismund's office, they startled the priest just as he was removing his vestments. Reverend Father, your words are true. The devil's carriage has come. The priest says, This is really very extraordinary. Thank you, my brothers. Please leave me a moment as I need to think what must be done now. He walks to the window, cocks his head, listening, then comes to a decision, turns, and hurries out the door. 
Just around the corner, he steps into the cool darkness of the police station and rings the bell. A police officer comes out of the back office. He's about 50. His hair is short, his handlebar mustache is well waxed, but his uniform is somewhat rumpled. When he recognizes the priest, he straightens his posture, greeting him with a salute. Greetings, Reverend. Yes, yes, hello. The priest looks to the left and right. Are we alone? Yes, Reverend, of course. They both take chairs. As they sit, the priest says, During last week's Mass, my sermon last Sunday, begins the priest, I was warning of the coming of demons, and today, just a short time ago, my monks have informed me that demons have arrived, here, in our town. Heralded by noise and smoke, a devil's carriage rolled by, pulled by invisible horses. The police officer is momentarily speechless. He quickly stands up. Reverend, my men and I will investigate this immediately. I will be very thankful for that, answers the priest as he rises more slowly. We must find it. Further down the road, Bertha and the boys stop at the marketplace to find water for the wagon. The three of them are a little nervous after seeing the strong uneasiness of the crowd, and most of the people in the marketplace are already reacting strongly as well. Dogs bark, horses whinny, squawking chickens are flying. As Bertha shuts off the engine next to the water pump, Eugen and Richard jump down, Eugen grabbing the water canister. Richard pumps while Eugen holds the canister until it's full. Then he takes it over to the engine and Richard unscrews the cap. A group of people watch from a distance, leery and muttering among themselves. A passel of young kids approach, egging each other to come get a closer look at this unusual machine. One boy runs close and kicks one of the rear wheels. After stowing the canister, Eugen climbs up and takes the steering wheel. Bertha sits at his right, Richard spins the large flywheel and starts up the engine. As the wagon starts to shake and smoke, the kids jump away and the adults have a mixture of reactions. And only two men are smiling, admiring the spectacle of this new innovation. Eugen says, Phew, that was tight. Back on the path next to the tracks. They make good time for the next hour or so, since the roads are still relatively level. Then Eugen breaks the silence. Pretty soon we're going to start climbing a hill. Sure enough, as the grade begins to steepen, the motor wagon slows more and more. Bertha says, Eugen, let Richard take the steering. You and I need to push. Eugen slows to a stop and pulls on the brake. Richard takes his place as Eugen and Bertha climb down. Being careful of the rear wheel chains and the flywheel, they find spots to push, and Richard starts the wagon off again. Slowly but steadily, the motor wagon climbs the hill and reaches the top. After a short breather, Bertha retakes the wheel and starts looking for the next spot to get water. They need to find water about every 15 miles just to keep the engine cool. She steers the wagon into the shade, behind the barn, near a line of trees which seem to indicate a little stream. They all climb off, stretch, and try to beat some of the road dust from their clothes. Only one-third of the way to Bertha's mother's house, and they are already getting oily and filthy. Oregon says, oh my, that was a tough hill. Bertha and Richard simply nod in agreement. Bertha goes back and opens the water tank. Richard empties the remaining water from the canister into the tank and then heads to the trees and stream for more water. Some minutes later, as Richard tops off the tank, they hear horses coming up the road at a great pace. All three get quiet as they look beyond the edge of the barn and see three policemen galloping by down the road they've just been traveling. Bertha whispers, That was very lucky, I think. It's just possible they have come looking for us. Do you think they could have already discovered that this motor wagon has gone from the factory? 
Eugen suggests, why don't we take a break? It's cool down by the stream. She is now smiling and happy to see the boys running along the water. Okay, so this is the third installment, starting uh, about a third of the way down page 15. Soon they return to the motor wagon and are pang pang panging down the lumpy road. As soon as we reach Vislo, we need to buy Ligroin, Bertha says. They stop at the market square in front of the city's pharmacy. Telling the boys to remain with the motor wagon, Bertha jumps down from the seat, walks confidently over to the stairs and climbs them to the pharmacy door. Finding it locked, she knocks on the door. A moment later, the door opens and a friendly pharmacist smiles out at Bertha. She sees a gray-haired older man wearing a white shirt, black vest, and a wise look in his eye. Holding a monocle in his hand, he gestures Bertha into the shop. Though Bertha's clothes are dusty and splattered a bit with oil, he appears not to notice and simply says, I am Ockel, my Fraulein, how can I help you on this sunny Sunday? He looks out the door at the curious onlookers, sees the motor wagon, and then returns his gaze to Bertha. My dear Mr. Ockel, please can you help us? My sons and I are on our way to Fortsheim, and now we need more fuel for the motor wagon. Oh, this is a surprise. May I come see it? Mr. Ockel follows Bertha back out and down the steps to the plaza. Never seen anything like this. Usually I deal only with sick people. Now you say your motor wagon needs my help. A few of my customers have mentioned that there is an engineer up in Mannheim who built a wagon which can travel without horses. Yes, that's right. He is my husband, Carl Benz, Bertha says delightfully. Mr. Ockel looks pleased. I am honored to meet you. A few of the citizens standing nearby followed the conversation and the buzzing of the crowd increased. These are our two sons, Eugen and Richard. Both boys remove their hats in respect and smile politely to Mr. Ockel. Mr. Ockel turns back to Bertha and asks, What could I possibly provide for your voyage? Bertha hands him her fuel canister and a bottle. We need Ligroin. Ten liters. Altogether, if you have it. Ten liters, he says in surprise. That is very much. And this is your fuel? I usually only sell it in 20 milliliter bottles. Let me see how much I have in the large bottle. In the back corner of the shop, he pulls out a large bottle, about half full of clear liquid. The handwritten label says, Ligroin. Bertha gracefully stands next to the counter while Mr. Ockel brings the large bottle over. So this is my medicine for your motor wagon, he smiles at his joke, and Bertha laughs. He tells her sadly, this is all I have, maybe, maybe five liters. Mr. Ockel steps out from around the counter, heads out the door and down the stairs to the waiting vehicle with Bertha in his wake. Mr. Ockel is obviously excited and proud to participate in such an unusual event. Eugen and Richard have already refilled the water tank on the vehicle and are leaning against one of the large rear wheels as Bertha and Mr. Ockel stride up. Eugen opens the fuel tank and steps back. Mr. Ockel pours Ligroin into the tank. When it's full, there is still a little remaining in the bottle, so Richard holds the fuel can out towards him with a smile. Bertha says, thank you so much. Mr. Ockel answers with a slight bow to her and pours the last of his ligruin into their canister. Bertha pulls out her money purse, but Mr. Ockel waves it away. I'm very honored that you came to me. No need to pay this time. Give my greetings to your husband, Mr. Carl Benz. With a quick nod, Bertha accepts his generosity. Oh, I will. She climbs back onto the motor wagon, followed by Richard, while Eugen goes to the rear to start the engine. It fires up immediately and begins idling with its typical puck, puck, puck and a steady, persistent shaking. A few people jump back at the sound. Some even clap. Mr. Ockel is briefly startled, but then grins broadly at this amazing new noise. Richard has already stowed the spare fuel canister, and Eugen, with a flare of showmanship, 
swings lightly up onto his seat besides Bertha. With relief, she lets off the brake and pushes the throttle lever forward slightly and they pull off along the street leading out of Wieslo. Each person they pass reacts differently. Some peer in disbelief, some are shocked, some are yelling, others are waving, but none are aloof or immune to the excitement of the event. For the next 20 kilometers, the trio is driving along relatively smoothly. They pass along fields, cross streams and rivulets where they routinely replenish their water, cross through forests, eventually arriving at Stettfeld where they track down another pharmacy to top off the fuel tank and spare canister. After making it slowly to the top of a small rise, they can see the next town not too far ahead. Once they begin their descent, they pick up speed on the downhill side, but with their increased speed, the grass and dirt clods in the middle of the two-lane track make it more difficult to steer. Bertha pulls on the brake to slow their pace, but by now, because the brakes are simply wooden blocks, they have become glazed and slick, which do almost nothing to slow them down. Even with the padding on the seats and the well-sprung wheels, it is not enough to cushion the jarring impact of each clod and stone as they quickly roll down the hill. The wagon is clanking and rattling fiercely. Eugen complains, My, that hurts! The wagon is shaking side to side uncomfortably. I can barely stand it, says Richard. I think I'm going to fall off. Finally, they reach the bottom of the slope and coast to a stop. Richard laughs nervously. That was dangerous. Bertha says, not only that, something's wrong with the drive chain. Sure enough, one of the chains has jumped the gear in all the ruckus. We're going to need some help to get this back on, she continues. We're not far from Brooksall. There is sure to be a blacksmith. Let's walk on in, see what we can find. Let's get something to eat, too, says Richard. I'm getting hungry. Good idea, she says. We could all stand a little break from the hammering. Eugen adds, yeah, let's go. I'm also hungry. Bertha looks at the boys' clothes in dismay. We need to dust off as well. They begin hiking toward town, and fairly soon they cross a wooden bridge over a small river. Just past the trees, they see smoke rising from a roofed structure and hear the hammering of a blacksmith. The blacksmith is a large, well-muscled man in his forties, wearing a thick leather apron over his stained blue work clothes. Good afternoon. We could use your help, Bertha says. Well, hello, folks, he calls out. How may I help you? One of the chains jumped off its gear as we were coming down the hill. We're hoping you can make the repair. Our motor wagon is just a ways on the other side of the stream. Motor wagon? I've heard of the motor wagon. Isn't this the vehicle made by that engineer up in Mannheim, Carl Benz? Yes, that's right. I'm Bertha. Bertha Benz, the wife of Carl Benz. Then she points to the boys, who then straighten up. And these are our sons, Eugen and Richard. What for a surprise. I'm so pleased to meet you. I look forward to seeing this motor wagon I've heard about. The trio are grinning with delight that they've finally found another friendly face in their travels. Hans! Walter, come here, he calls to his sons. Let's go get these fine people's wagon and bring it here. All together, they traipse off to get the wagon. And once they arrive at it, the blacksmith can't stop chuckling to himself as he walks with amazement around the vehicle. His sons, as well, are curious and inspecting carefully every aspect of the wagon. Now, finally, I see the machine I've heard so much about. Your husband is brilliant. But I assume you already know that. Though I've also heard from more than a few that they are not very happy with this machine, even afraid of it. Some say it's the harbinger of the devil. He rolls his eyes as if dismayed. Eugen and Richard giggle and Bertha complains. It has not been easy. For the last couple of years, Carl drove through Mannheim and only a few people seemed to complain of the noise. But now, just two weeks ago, the police came to the door and announced that from now on we will have to have guards posted at our gate to ensure Carl no longer drives on the streets. He's only allowed to drive within our own property. Oh no, exclaims the smith. He turns to his sons. Can you believe it? He turns back to Bertha and the boys. And now you are making a leisurely Sunday tour? Ha 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 ha! That is just so funny. You are very brave. Aren't you concerned about the police? 
I suppose we should be. We did see some officers rushing down the road earlier. I just hope they weren't looking for us. Where do you get fuel for this machine? We can always get some at the pharmacies, answered Eugen proudly. Our first stop was the city pharmacy in Wieslo, Brett adds. Oh, with our Mr. Ockel, the blacksmith is amused. He's a fine man, that one. Now, boys, let's get this wagon back to the shop. I'll steer, Richard says proudly as he scrambles up onto the wagon. The smith and his sons easily push the wagon along the trail back to their shop as Eugen and Bertha follow behind. There's one other problem you might possibly help us with, states Bertha. Our brakes are glazed and are nearly worthless on hills. I thought that if you could nail some heavy leather onto them, make some leather pads onto the wood, they will maintain friction even under pressure. The smith looks at her even more respectfully. You appear to be a capable engineer in your own right. Is this your idea? Well, yes, she answered. It seemed like the logical solution. Then I'll certainly take care of that problem as well. It is a good idea. Is there somewhere we can buy a meal? We haven't eaten much since we set out this morning, and I'm afraid we're all rather hungry. The smith heads toward the back of the shop for tools, and the smoke curling up from the forge makes him hard to see, but his voice comes through clearly. That building just past the fork in the road is the inn, and they have a respectable restaurant. I'll come get you when your wagon is ready, replied the smith. He watched with a big smile as the three head to the inn. On the ground floor of the building is an old, traditionally decorated restaurant with wooden benches and heavy plank tables. They choose one near a window, and soon the serving girl has filled the table with plates of sausages, potatoes, and sauerkraut. They are enjoying their meal as well as the respite from their tour. They chat endlessly about the details of their travel so far. Eugen says, These roads are really not easy to drive on with the front wheel bumping along so much. Lost in thought, Eugen stirs his fork in his sauerkraut, making circles. Your papa has tried to make a four-wheeled wagon, but for whatever reason, the steering is very hard with four wheels. It makes for a very hard time to drive. I believe he will solve the problem someday, but for now, having a single front steering wheel is what works. As they are cleaning up the last bits of their hearty meal, Bertha notices some activity down by the blacksmith's shop. She pulls the curtain aside to see. Three mounted policemen are stopped in front of the shop. One of them is questioning the smith, who is standing next to the closed doors of his shop. The smith then nods and points toward the fork in the road. The policeman looks that way, gathers up his men by eye, takes up the reins, and they begin trotting up the road towards the fork. They pick up the pace as they turn right and begin galloping off toward the west. The smith looks toward the restaurant, grins, and then turns back to the open shop door and returns inside. Some time later, they've all had a chance to freshen up in the washroom and are sitting back at the table. The smith comes in through the door and nods to them as he approaches with a sly smile. He joins them at the table and says, We had some curious visitors at the shop a little while ago, searching for what they described as some kind of a smoking monster. They called it a witch's carriage. The smith continues, It just so happened that I directed them down the westward road, hinting that I'd heard that a vehicle making odd noise was headed that way some time ago, the smith continued. I also mentioned that I thought I overheard someone say the machine was probably headed toward Karlsruhe. <laughs> Bertha and the boys are smiling widely now. I urged them to move quickly as they probably have a long ways to go to catch up with it. After settling up with the innkeeper, they walk back to the smithy and go inside. Bertha notices that both drive chains look clean, even shiny. Oh, the chains look like new, she says happily. My pleasure, remarks the smith charmingly. And I sent my son Walter over to the shoemaker for some leather scraps. I believe your new brakes will work much better now. And here are some extra pieces already cut to fit in case these should wear thin. Bertha glows. Oh, this is so helpful. You are a godsend. How much do I owe you for all of your great service? For you? My service today is free, answers the blacksmith. It is enough that you have allowed me to make repairs on your husband's motor wagon. It truly is a wonder, a memory I will always cherish. 
You are too kind. Thank you so much. I will certainly inform my husband of your generosity. Oh, that certainly pleases me, answered the blacksmith. Bertha turns to the boys. Richard, you should drive for a while. And Eugen, why don't you show our new friend how to start the engine? Once Richard has opened the fuel valve, Eugen tells the smith to simply give the wheel a strong spin. As the engine catches and begins its steady panging, the smith stands back, filled with pride for his contribution. This is fun! Thank you! You're very welcome, adds Eugen with a nod. He jumps into the wagon and takes his place on the front seat facing his mother and brother. The wagon pulls forward through the double doors and out onto the road. They pick up a little speed as they turn south, heading onward toward Fortsheim in a cloud of smoke and dust. Chapter 3 They continue on through the afternoon, stopping for water at every well, stream, and tavern they find along the way. A little while after leaving Untergrombach, they are traveling through a woodland when the engine coughs and sputters to a stop. Bertha and Eugen drop to the road and go back to confront the engine. She says, I hope it's nothing serious, Richard reminds them. This often happened in the past, but Papa always got it running again. That's right, but then Carl was always there, comments Bertha. Organ checks the fuel tank, sees that there's still plenty of Ligroin. He picks up a little stick and starts tapping on pipes and looking at various valves, checks the water tank. Using the stick as a pointer, Eugen aims it at one of the lines. Perhaps the fuel line is blocked. Bertha gets an idea. Please bring me the wrench. Once she has unscrewed the fuel line, she pulls one of the long hat pins from her hat and pushes it into the line. Sure enough, there is a clog. She digs it out and quickly reconnects the pipe before much fuel dribbles out. Now let's test it quickly. Bertha cleans her hat pin and her hands on a rag. The day is rushing by and we still have a long journey ahead of us. Eugen spins the flywheel, but the engine only chugs once and stops. He tries again, and this time, the engine sputters to life and starts running normally. Bertha sticks the hat pin back into her hat, climbs up the motor wagon, followed by Eugen, and Richard swings up to resume steering. He lets off the brake, pushes the throttle forward, and they again take up their voyage toward Bertha's mother's house. Near Weingarten, the land becomes more and more hilly, and their progress is sometimes slowed when they have to get out and push the vehicle up a hill. The only incessant worry is finding water, but with luck they come across the random brook or farmhouse with a well. It's late afternoon, but the summer sun is still plenty high in the sky for many more hours of light. As they approach a little river bridge and prepare for their next water stop, the engine abruptly shuts off. Again. As they coast to a stop, Bertha exclaims, Maybe the fuel line clogged again. Eugen jumps to the ground and starts looking carefully over the engine. Mother, I think I see the problem, says Eugen. Looks like something wrong with this electric cable. Bertha comes back to peer at the spark plug cable and sees that it has rubbed against the frame so much that the insulation wore off and it has shorted out. Eugen says, I don't think we brought a replacement cable, did we? I have an idea, Bertha states. She goes to the side of the wagon for a little more privacy, reaches under her skirt and removes one of her garters. Then she drops her skirt again and holds it up proudly. We'll use this to re-insulate the wire. She rips the seam in the garter and then wraps the fabric around and around the worn wire a number of times, then ties the ends tightly. Eugen and Richard are laughing, delighted, and only slightly embarrassed. Let's try it, Richard says excitedly. Bertha grabs the flywheel and starts the engine. At first the engine just coughs, kicks backward for one revolution, then kicks again properly and begins firing and spinning normally in a clockwise direction. The boys, grinning broadly, hug each other. Bertha beams. Oh my, that was luck. Then she tells them, let's fill up the water and fuel tanks while we're stopped. She shuts the fuel valve and the engine spins to a stop. Eugen pours in the last of the fuel from the canister while Richard takes the water can down to the river to fill. Once the fuel and water are topped off, Richard starts the engine. They all climb aboard to continue on their journey. At about 6.30, they see Solingen up ahead at the base of a hill. Bertha offers, we should make a break and ask for the shortest way. They spot a restaurant up ahead. 
As the wagon approaches, four men standing in front of the restaurant stop their chatting and simply turn to stare at them in their motor wagon. The men don't seem afraid, merely surprised, mixed with a high level of curiosity. One man steps forward and asks, What is that for a noisy machine? Where are the horses? The other three nod to themselves. Berta smiles and says, Good afternoon. This is a motor wagon, not a horse wagon. We've no need for horses or oats. It's much better. To the boys, she says, Let's dust ourselves off and go in. The men watch them skeptically, whispering to one another and unsure what to say, as the trio climbs off the wagon and goes inside the restaurant. Bertha leads them to an empty table where they sit. She takes off her hat and uses her fingers to push order into her unruly hair. When the waiter comes by, they order a simple dinner, and then Bertha asks, Sir, can you give me the direction for the fastest way to Fortsheim? He makes a gesture indicating that it would be a bad idea. He says, Fortsheim, today? It's at least two hours away. Bertha gets impatient. Please, just describe to me where we can find the shortest route. The second street on the left, up there, he points. That's the road which will lead you to it. Thank you very much. That was all she needed. They finished their meal, paid the bill, and left. Richard assumes the steering. Bertha climbs up next to him as Eugen starts the engine and takes his seat. Just as they are pulling away, they see the astonished faces of people inside the restaurant peering out the window at them. They take the left turn and begin the climb up a long hill. The track is more rough than they expect and they get shaken more than usual, making it difficult for Richard to steer, yet they slowly but surely make it to the top. As they were told, it was nearly two hours of plodding, but they soon see Fortsheim up ahead. It's now about 8 p.m. and the sun is soon to set. Already they see lights on in many houses. With a sigh of relief, they all share a smile at their accomplishment. The engine pang pang pangs its way on up the hill into the town and they finally make it to the inn, Sir Post, where they stop the engine and climb off for a stretch and to shake off as much dust as possible from their clothes and hair. They notice two horse wagons nearby. A man is there calming the jittery horses, still wide-eyed in fear, though the noise of their engine has stopped. People from the hotel come out into the twilight to gawk in wonder and to chatter about the machine now parked in front of the door. The restaurant owner, a hefty man in his 60s, wearing a chef's apron, also comes out to get a good look at this marvel. He looks friendly and welcomes them warmly. Where are your horses? Did someone fetch them already? Bertha answers, I'm sorry for the misunderstanding, sir, but we have no horses. She points to the engine on the back of the vehicle. This is a motor wagon, driven by an engine, not pulled by horses. The owner and other guests are puzzled, but many step a little closer to get a better view of the contraption. Meanwhile, 30 kilometers away, the three policemen are at the Karlsruhe police station asking for any information or reports of a smoking monster anywhere in the city. By the way, she continues, I need to send an urgent telegram. Where can I do that? Ah, oh, yes, madam, certainly. Please follow me, answers the owner, who leads them inside to the telegraph room. Here, my lady. Write the text down that you wish to send, please. He gives Bertha paper and a pencil. I can send it immediately. To the boys, she says, I'm sending a telegram to Papa to inform him of our safe arrival. She writes, First long-distance trip successful. Arrived well in Fortsheim. And hands it to the owner, who smiles at her, then begins tapping on the telegraph machine. Finally, in the hotel, the three get a chance to bathe, rest, and get a good night's sleep. In the morning, they arrive at the house of Bertha's mother, Augusta Ringer. Carl's reply arrives soon after they settle in. Augusta and the boys gather round as Bertha eagerly opens the envelope. Very glad for safe arrival. Proud of you. Hurry home. Bertha's mother beams at the three of them proudly. The next few days are a pleasant blur of happy chatting, 
shopping in Fortsheim, delicious meals, and the daily exchange of telegrams with Carl. Late in the week, after a round of hugs and well wishes, they say their final goodbyes, remount the motor wagon, and begin their return home. Except for the occasional need to push the wagon up a hill, they make their return journey to Mannheim without incident or delay. Finally arriving home close to sundown, they are confident that the guards will have left for the day. Still, rather than alert anyone of their arrival, they stop on the opposite side of the field behind their property and push the wagon the rest of the way in and through the back gate. Carl and the two daughters, as well as a few employees, come rushing into the back to welcome them. Carl sweeps Bertha off her feet in an exuberant hug, then wraps his arms around the boys as well. Bertha kisses the girls. The employees shake hands with the two boys and everyone seems to be talking at once, excited and full of curiosity. The group troops back into the house where Bertha, Eugen, and Richard look forward to a warm bath and clean clothes. I'm so happy that you're all back safely, remarks Carl. But you know you really are a bunch of rascals. Even so, I am delighted that my invention survived the journey. You have confirmed my faith in my engineering. I must confess, I had my doubts that this machine could withstand the rigors of a long drive. Bertha replies, I'm sorry to have abused your machine so, but I too am so happy it worked as well as it did. Yes, and I need to hear your thoughts about how I can improve this motor wagon. I decided to exhibit it in next month's big carriage convention in Munich. After a month of revamping various mechanisms and coming up with design enhancements, Carl places his invention on the train and accompanies it to Munich. With the city's approval, he is allowed to drive around downtown Munich every afternoon during the convention. Everywhere he goes, he is cheered and admired. Laughing children chase his motor wagon down the street. As a result of the great press he receives, as well as the fame his wife and sons generated from their remarkable road trip, his so-called self-driving wagon becomes extremely well accepted and he wins the top prize of the event, taking home the grand gold medallion. The rest truly is history. To learn more fascinating and little-known details and events surrounding the invention of the gasoline-powered automobile, please feel free to reach out to us. A number of the stories we have gathered are certain to astound you. Write to us at uli.kampelman at yahoo.com.